One hand intensifies after fatal attack on a home in Alavano Deme. Maize production in Ashanti region threatened by invasion. Good evening and welcome to News Hour, live on GBC 24 and Ghana Television. My name is Emmanuel Amagashi. And I am Salma Taki. Thank you so much for joining us. Our first story, the president, Nana Ekufadu, has asked the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG, to reconsider their call for autonomy of public universities, among other concerns. The president made the suggestion when members of UTAG called on him at the flagstaff house in Accra. This is the second meeting of the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG in five months since the president assumed office. The university teachers have a number of concerns that they want addressed. This second meeting involved President Tekufado, Vice President Dr. Baumia, the Minister for Education Dr. Matthew Pokuprempe, and the executives of the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG. Their concerns include funding of public tertiary institutions, which UTAG thinks is not adequate, and inclusion of the people in academia in public decision making, staff motivation, market premium and assistance for the construction of a national secretariat of the association. The teachers association called on the president to allow recruitment of university lecturers which has been put on hold because the universities need financial clearance before they can employ. UTAG is calling for extension of retirement age from 60 to 65. The university body is asking for a comeback of a roadmap which was in 2005 initiated to allow entry salary of a university teacher at $1,500. The association believes that when autonomy is given to the universities, their salaries will be better. The president of UTAC, Dr. Harry Agbanu, called for the reconstitution of various councils on the university since it is hampering quality delivery. Unfortunately, for the past five months or so, uh, universities do not have their councils in place. We are aware the government is doing everything to reconstitute the, the councils. We just want to appeal that uh, the process be fast-tracked as it is affecting uh, decision-making in the various institutions. We are also of the opinion that the determination of or the negotiation of our conditions of service is one of the uh, roles of the University Council. The Minister for Education, Dr. Matthew Pokuprempe, and the President Ekufuado asked them to reconsider the autonomy issue since public universities are funded by government. All specific university councils have the power to determine its conditions of service and implement especially when the funding is coming from the central government. If the university council determines that we should pay $20,000 a month, should it be accepted by the government in the government campaign? So I'll plead with you, you tell me, that either yourself or your representative or your negotiator would engage this exercise then, and let us all sit down whether even if with a specific university council that they are all be appointed by the president or the president, or which is the current law that everybody goes to, or whatever we will decide for ourselves. I'm impressed by the, the argument that the minister is making, that there is a body whose function it is to arbitrate, to mediate, to look at these matters, and we should try and seize that body first. But I'd like to say that the composition of the council, which is one of the first things that you raised, is something that was going to be dealt with very soon. I am interested in your, the matters that you have brought up because I'm interested in your welfare, because I'm interested in making sure that we have a good educational system here in Ghana. Because if we're able, in my time to deal with all of these problems and get our educational system vibrant as a, a motivated teacher force in Ghana, that's half the battle for our future secure. 
President Akufuado said he is interested in quality education to turn the fortunes of the country around. He promised to address all the concerns of the Teacher Association for quality education delivery in the country. The military police force has intensified a manhunt surveillance in both Alavanyo and Inkonya following attacks by unknown gunmen on a home in Alavanyo Deme. A 15-year-old boy, Prince Ankuche, was shot dead and another, Alex Adiku, was wounded in the attack. Alex Adiku is responding to treatment at the Margaret Market Hospital at Bandu. The old conflict between the people of Nkonya and Alavanyo has been heightened following the sporadic guerrilla-style shooting which has fueled the conflict. In recent months, the two communities have reported unprovoked shooting by unknown gunmen resulting in deaths. A similar guerrilla-style attack was visited on a home in Alavanyo Dema where two boys were said to be preparing their meal. One was killed instantly while the other sustained gunshot wounds. But the latter is responding to treatment at the Pandu Margaret Marquardt Hospital. The two communities now live in fear as security personnel try to restore peace and calm. According to the police administration, no arrests have been made so far, but pledged to bring the perpetrators to book. Meanwhile, the dawn to dusk curfew imposed on the two communities is still in force. Let's now go to the Ashanti region, where maize production in the region is being threatened by the invasion of the small army worms this year. Large tracts of maize farms have been destroyed by the pests. Agri officials and farmers are therefore calling for an urgent national response to curb the plague of army worms on other crops. The four army worms are similar in physical characteristics to the popular army worm or caterpillar. They, however, have slightly different features and also attack the plants in droves. They originate from the Americas and are said to be migratory and destructive in nature. The pests first attacked maize farms during the August-September 2016 minor farming season but caused less damage to crops. An expatriate large-scale farmer in the Ashantia Chimno district, near Gugu, lost a 200-acre maize farm to the four army worm during that period. The regional directorate of Agric said the invasion this time around has caused damage to about a thousand acres of maize farms. Mr. Samapa Bio is an Agric Extension officer who supervises about 2,000 600 smallholder crop farmers. Now when you plant the field, the first 10 days you have to go and do scouting. You scout, you scout for the early detection of the pest. When the adult moat lays its eggs on leaf, they, they hatch into the larvae. The initial damage of the larvae is that what they call, they normally scratch the chlorophyll component of the leaves and they create windows on the leaves. So that is the first stage that one has to do the control measures. If you delay your farm and wait for the adults and, and larvae to be assuming this stage, they normally become very difficult to control. The officer in charge of extension service at the Edjusu Jabi Municipal Directorate of Agrik, Mr. Bismarck Asante Asari, blamed the plague of army worms on the rainfall pattern this year. One heavy rain and you, it will, you have about two weeks in between before you have the second rain. And in between these rains, it's always the, the sun intensity, the heat, and the warm itself, I believe, is a contributing factor to this uh, many. The Ashanti Regional Director of Agric, Mr. Joseph Fallon, said the four army worm invasion has spread to all 30 districts of the region, including fields that have been cultivated and the planting for food and jobs program. Mr. Fallon said a remedial measure is being implemented to get to further spread. Thankfully, you people are doing this good job because by the time the farmers see this, they will be asking us, what can I do? And I'm happy to announce that the Minister for Agriculture assured me that I'll be taking delivery of the first batch of chemicals that will help us to give this chemical out to the spraying gangs that we have formed in all the districts. And we want to assure them that the chemical is also on the market. 
what government is giving us is for the emergency control of a disaster situation. But if you are also a farmer, you also own the farm, and you realize that here is the Ministry of Food and Agriculture offering to control the pest in this way and that way, you also learn. And as you learn, you also mount the surveillance on your own farm so that as soon as you spot the worm, you don't wait unnecessarily for a total devastation to take place. The national capital, a deputy minister for health, Madam Tina Mensa, says the government is taking steps to address the human resource and unemployment challenges facing the ministry in a more sustainable way. She said this when Ghana joined the rest of the world to celebrate nurses and midwives in Accra. <laughs> The 17th International Nurses and Midwives Day was organized in Accra with the theme Health Implications of Galamse and the Attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals, Nurses and Midwives Acting in One Voice with Stakeholders. The president of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association, Mr. Kwekwa Sante Krobia, called on government to regulate the training of auxiliary nurses whose numbers far outnumber professional nurses and midwives. In the world of work today, and as the good, work, as the good book states, it is the one to whom much is given, from whom much is always expected. Rather, on the contrary, whereas nurses and midwives have been given less resources, meager remuneration and no job place incentives, so much is being expected of us. I emphasize that this is criminally against national law and justice. The Director of External Relations and Communication of the Ghana Chamber of Mind, Mr. Ahmed Nantongma, says the fight against Galamse can be won when all hands on deck approach is adopted. Irresponsible mining cannot be blamed on the foreigner. It can be blamed on Ghanaians, on you and I are all involved in the illegal activity. It is you and I and our fathers and our mothers who give them our lands for mining. If we stop and we involve the authorities, I'm sure that I'm saying will be reduced. A deputy minister for health, Madame Tina Mensa, assured nurses and midwives of government's commitment to fulfill its promise of providing Ghanaians with quality health care. We are taking note of the agitation of the unemployed nurses and midwives and wish to say that the ministry is taking practical steps to address the human resources issues in a more sustainable way. We call on all health professionals to exercise patience, while His Excellency takes conjoint steps to tackle the unemployment problem in the country. A sketch titled, Rallying Around the Lamp, was demonstrated. The lamp representing nurses and midwives' devotion hard work and readiness to serve from generation to generation, giving hope to their patients, a symbol of their readiness to stand still, irrespective of the challenges they encounter. Ten hard-working nurses and midwives from the ten regions of the country were honored for their outstanding performance. Human activities have been identified as the major stumbling block impeding construction works on the Nima storm drains in Accra. Though the drain is more than 80% complete, it was revealed that some people have turned the concrete drains into their place of abode, while others smoke Indian hemp in the drain. And this came to light when the Railroad and Highways Minister, Mr. Kwesi Amwakwata, inspected projects in Zango communities. Nuto Bibini Nuto has more to the story. Install among Zango communities in the country due to the large numbers of inhabitants. The sprawling, densely populated Nima, together with Mamubi and Accra New Town, have gained notoriety for all manner of deviance due to poverty and low levels of education. The lack of proper planning of Zangos, especially Nima, means absence of access roads, a situation that makes it difficult for emergency services such as fire service to reach problem areas in times of fire outbreak. Waste collection is not part of the life in Nima. Hence, human and solid waste are thrown into the Nima gutter which choke the Odol River, resulting in the perennial flooding in parts of Accra. In October 2015, the past government commissioned Brazilian contractors Queiroz Galvao, 
to construct these closed concrete drains from Kaokuri Junction on the Kanda Highway through Nima and Mamobi. Though contractors have gone far with work, they had met stiff resistance as buildings close to the Nima drains had to be broken. With the drains component done, the contractor is left with linkage roads on either side of the drains, with one linking the Kanda Highway and another Mamobi Highway. During a site visit by the sector minister, Mr. Kwesia Mwakwata and his team of engineers, they found that the illegal human activities still impede progress of work. Some people have turned the, this uh, bus drain you know, as, uh, uh, I mean, into a residence and that there are people under who are living there with beds. <laughs> It's dangerous. I, I don't know what we can do about it because, you know, it touches on, on, on the safety of our, our, our people. The Minister for Inner Cities and Zango Development, Boniface Abubakar Sadiq, said sensitization programs with beneficiary communities is the way to go. The delay is also being caused by the people who have taken the place as their habitat, which is dangerous, you know, both for the contractors and also for the community. But I want to assure you, with the cooperation that we are getting from the Minister for Rules and Highways, I can assure you that all this thing will be resolved within the shortest possible time. From here, the team inspected some ongoing road projects at Medina, another Zango community in Accra. This took them through the Zango Junction, where an uncompleted overpass was inspected in order to expedite action on it. The last port of call was Medina Zango BB where age-old drains that were being constructed were abandoned for lack of space due to reckless human settlement along the stream, a situation that causes flood whenever it rains. Nto Bibini Nto, GBC 24, Accra. The Ghana National Fire Service has inspected some nightclubs in Usu. The objective is to ascertain whether the facilities comply with fire safety measures to protect lives and property. We'll bring you that story later. Now, an orientation and induction seminar has been held for members of parliament at Kufudia in the eastern region. The minority leader in parliament, Mr. Haruna Idrisu, asked the MPs to be abreast of issues to enable them participate in debates in parliament. The second session of the Orientation and Induction Seminar for members of the 7th Parliament of the 4th Republic was to deepen their knowledge in the role and functions of Parliament, parliamentary practice and procedures, and legislative processes. The seminar under the theme, Deepening Transparent and Accountable Governance, Strengthening Parliament for National Development, discussed how the MPs can effectively participate in debates on the floor of Parliament. The minority leader, Mr. Haruna Idrisu, encouraged the lawmakers to be guided by national interest and uphold their integrity at all times. Parliamentary practice, techniques, procedure and processes remains a lifelong learning activity for all elected members of parliament. We need to deepen transparency and accountability. We need to contribute to deepen good governance and we need to strengthen parliament for national development through policy review and our legislative review exercise. The majority leader, Mr. Seiche Mensa Bunsu, said the seminar is to serve as an anchor to pep the MPs up in their daily task in Parliament. It's observed that um, standards are increasingly getting lowered in, in the House. And so we thought it's important to bring this discourse back to the front burner and hope that by the end of these workshops, members will be better positioned to participate in the business of parliament. The majority leader, Mr. Osei Chaimen Sabunso, said the seminar is to serve as an anchor to prep the MPs up in their daily task in parliament. 
and the Ghana National Fire Service has embarked on a fire safety inspection exercise at some night clubs in Ogosu. The objective is to ascertain whether the facilities comply with fire safety measures to save lives and property. The fire safety inspection by the Ghana National Fire Service forms part of measures to ensure that public facilities have fire certificates and comply with fire safety regulations. The team visited some nightclubs at Osu, including Hot Gossip Nightclub, Vanity Club, Plot 7, Jokers, Caesars Casino, Venus Lounge, and Epos. At Jokers Nightclub, the fire officers found out that most of the electrical cables were hanging loosely and exposed. A gas cylinder had also been placed in the kitchen. The Vanity Club has fire safety measures, including emergency exits, but the fire certificate had expired. Plot 7 and Hot Gossip Nightclubs were the only facilities with valid fire certificates. At Caesar Casino, the team from the fire service were denied access to the facility, hence the issuance of temporary closure notice. They don't have even any fire defense arrangement at the place. They also don't have any fire certificate, so they decided to obstruct us from doing our work. And by a lie, 1724, 15, the chief officer is mandated to actually close down a place which is not safe in terms of fire safety. So we have closed this place down. The fire safety director at the Ghana National Fire Service headquarters, Mr. William Yorson, advised operators of the facility to ensure safety at all times to save lives and property. Not a single one of your extinguisher is actually hung on the wall. They are all sitting on the ground. On the wall. It is not allowed. Make sure that they are hung on the wall. Two, paint this place red and make sure that you get all the necessary fire service calling numbers. So that you write in case of fire, ring this, do this, do this. Now, a six-member appeals tribunal panel has been inaugurated to ensure transparency and fairness in the decision-making process of genetically modified organisms in Ghana. This is in line with provisions made in the National Biosafety Act. The Appeals Tribunal of the National Biosafety Authority has Professor Kwame Ofe, Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, as its chairman. The rest are Mrs. Grace Ama Isahak of the Registrar General's Department, Professor Albert Kujukwenu of the University for Development Studies, and Mrs. Diana Brandful of SEPS. One of the provisions of the National Biosafety Act is the institution of an appeals tribunal. Among its numerous roles is to resolve grievances that may arise in the implementation of the Act as several anti-GMO groups had raised concerns on the safe development, use, handling and effect of genetically modified organisms in Ghana. To us, it's a very great step and it means that um, our work can go on. I want to use this opportunity to, pro to pledge um, support and cooperation of the Secretariat to the, um, the, the, the tribunal and I hope we will work very well to serve our country. The panel pledged to work in the interest of the country, especially in the face of abuse of organisms. Biotechnology has a great promise for our country, like Ghana, in the sense that, you see, we would be able through this technology to uh, introduce and produce very productive uh, crops. It has applications in health. It has applications in industry, it has applications in the environment. As with most advanced technologies, its applications can be abused. And therefore, the need for there to be a regulatory framework which will guide its utilization and application. The Minister for Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, Professor Frimpom Wateng said, constituting the panel was in the right direction. The tribunal is there in the interest of the public. Anybody who is aggrieved in a lot of ways can appeal to this board of appeals, the appeal tribunal. For example, if somebody is refused a permit 
under the Bar Safety Act, that person can appeal to the tribunal. Or if we don't understand or agree to the conditions of the approval, we can also appeal. If your application is or your license is revoked, suspended, or revised, and you are not happy, you can appeal to the tribunal. And then if your application is not given the necessary confidentiality and you are aggrieved, you can also appeal to the tribunal. The sixth member of the appeals tribunal is Dr. Peter Chumesi of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. A renowned academic and former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, Emeritus Professor George Bene, has launched his latest book titled My Time, My Nation. The book profiles Professor Bene's life history and his works in academia. Bene is an emeritus professor of geography and resource development who was appointed lecturer in the Department of Geography at the University of Ghana, Legon in 1964. He rose through the ranks to full professorship in 1989. Professor Bene held administrative positions during his time at the University of Ghana, such as head of the Department of Geography and Resource Development, senior teacher of the Commonwealth Hall, dean of the Faculty of Social Studies, and pro vice chancellor before his appointment as vice chancellor in 1992. He has authored over 13 books and booklets and 70 publications spanning the fields of geography, environment, land tenure and land use, population, education and public administration. My Time, My Nation is the latest of his books, the 201 page book, which is a recollection of an accomplished academic and statesman, is to inspire leadership among younger people. The book was reviewed by former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Ernest Aite. In this book, there are 15 chapters, beginning with his birth and family. Um, and we learn through that he was born on 6th March, 1934, as exactly 23 years before Ghana became independent. He was the son of a man who later became a solid character in the CPP tradition. The most interesting thing that I gleaned from this chapter was the fact that even though his father had a rather large number of children from several wives, he made it his duty to document the birth of all his children in his own records. The book presents a brief account of Professor Bennett's life as a growing boy who desired to study history instead of geography and his pursuance of academic career. I thank God for keeping my brain functioning. This book, you will enjoy reading it. <laughs> it is written in simple style and it is engaging when you start reading it because the editors have also worked hard on it, including my covenant wife. Professor J. H. Kobinan Ketia launched the book and the first copy sold for 25,000 cities. Now this book is here to remind us of a history, uh, of a period of uh, history in our time. And I recommend that you all get copies and think about what the past means for the present and how we can proceed and get what we think we need to build a great Ghana. Present at the launch was the former president of Ghana, other top government appointees, academics among others. Today is Saturday and we are back shortly with my journey. My name is Edward Nyakun. Today I take you on a journey to the Gambia. There are over 3,000 Ghanaians resident in the Gambia, but half of these number went there to ensure that Ghanaians back home get kaku to eat. Kaku is a type of fish seasoned with salt, 
dried in the sun and can last for over two years. Let's take a look at what is happening in Ghana town in the Gambia. The coast of the Gambia can be likened to a magnet. It does not only pull tourists from Europe, but also fishermen from the west coast of Africa, including Ghana. This is Bakau, and one of the landing sites near the capital, Banjo. At the time of my arrival to the Bakau landing site, the fishermen have just returned from the expedition, and most of them were excited because they had had a bumper catch. The work of these fishermen do not only help put food on the tables of many a Gambian and even other nationals in the Ecowas market, but also create jobs. These women who deal in fish are always on hand to buy from them. This type of fish is referred to as barracuda and each is sold at $950, which is an equivalent of $19. And to ensure that individuals who came to the Bakau landing site to buy fish do not have to bother themselves about removing the scales or dressing the fish, these young men are always available to do it for a fee. They told me the fee depends upon the type of the fish they are working on, and a barracuda attracts a fee of about $50, which is a little over $1. From Bakau, I went to the biggest market in Banju, the Royal Albert Market, to see how the fish business is run. The market, which was named after Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, is located on the Liberation Avenue. This is the first market built by the British colonial people. So in this, in the colonial market, what do they sell here? They sell all types of foodstuffs. Baobab, couscous, sorrel juice, you can see, corns. They, they, they specialize on food, foodstuffs only. It is essential an emporium that is pungent, lively and bustling with a large selection of vividly designed fabrics. The fabric business is big in the Gambia and it is exciting to see even children displaying their sewing skills. Some of the traders said that when the Ajame was in power, the tax system was so harsh that each sewing machine attracted a yearly level of about $40. This to them made their clothes very expensive but now with his exit, they are hopeful that things will change for the better. The Albert market is laid out with labouring of alleys and hundreds of rickety stalls and purpose-built shops. There are three distinct markets here, the wholesale and retail market, that sells everything the local people could possibly want, from food produced to fruits, meat and vegetables. The size of the market makes it impressive and there is a plenty of choice. It is open from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Essentially, I went to the Albert market to follow up on the fish business, but when I got there, around 4.30 p.m., the fishmongers had closed. This area is the fish market, but you are, you are fortunate, you are late. When you come in the morning, you can see captain fish, barracuda, salt fish, all type of fish, butter fish. Though I missed out on meeting the fishmongers, one of my tour guides in the market, Babu, told me about a place in the Gambia known as Ghana Town. There is a town here, only Ghanaian live there in Burfoot. When you go there, you can eat kinky. <laughs> and a follow-up, I met one of the leaders in the Ghanaian community in the Gambia, Mr. Thomas Quaison. He said Ghanaians in the Gambia are over 2,000, but the largest community is in the Ghana town. We have a Ghanaian village called Ghana town, uh, people from the central region who are doing fishing. Uh, they, they, it's it's a, a sizable uh, population. And then we have a lot of teachers, you know, sort of professionals, mm. uh, we have uh, doctors, uh, we have uh, pastors and all those. So we have uh, at least about 2,000 Ghanaians in the Gambia. Ghana town is about 50 minutes drive from Banju, but before I set off, I decided to hit the street of Banju to see how nightlife in the Gambia looks like. But while on the street of Banju, Dunso showed up. So the next day, I set up on my base in Fajara to Ghana town, which is the home of about 1,000 Ghanaian fishermen and their families. This journey afforded me the opportunity to see the other side of the Gambia. I 
I observed that in the Gambia, vendoring fruits such as orange is done by men and not women as it is in Ghana. On arrival, I realized the town was quiet and most of the town folk had gone to fishing. But even at the shores of Ghana town, I found only Amatre, who told me that her colleagues had gone to the market to sell their fish. Achira, who hails from Abu Sea in the central region in Ghana, has been living in the Gambia for about 10 years, and said that the salt used in preserving the fish is imported from neighboring Senegal. She took me through the process of getting the kako done. When the fish is brought to the shore, we clean it, we season it, and we dry it. The mother of five said a 50 kilogram bag of kako when exported to Mankasim in Ghana, the hub of kako business costs about 70,000 sifa or $200. Kojo Tewia is one of the Ghanaian fishermen that has been doing business in the Gambia for the past 15 years. Okay. We came to Gambia because these type of fish can hardly be found in the Ghanaian water. Just beside Kojote, we were two teenagers, Presla and Imu, whose parents are also into fishing. Presla, who used to stay at Caprice in Accra, came to the Gambia in February 2017. Both shared their dreams with me. What class is Six. What class is I am in classes and I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a pilot. Actress said one of the challenges facing Ghanaians in the Gambia is a resident permit, which attracts an annual fee of about $50. And this was corroborated by other Ghanaians resident there. Getting a resident permit was difficult, but it has been addressed. If you don't have your ID card, you will not be able to cash your money. And without your ID card, even when you walk on the streets, immigration will be out looking for your ID. If you don't have it, you will be locked. Even first, you will be beaten and put behind, behind bars. But the ability of these fishermen to stay longer on the sea to do business is largely dependent upon the affordability of the permit fuel. Later for diesel is 46 dollars and uh, petrol is 47 dollars. 47. And how much is that? Like it's, like, it's like one dollar. Unlike Ghana, where fishermen go to fishing and their catch are usually full of polythene bags, the story is different in the Gambia. The beaches are clean and this is attributed to a ban placed on polythene bags by the former president of the Gambia, Yaya Jammu. And in order to be abreast with development back home in Ghana, Amatra told me she has bought a decoder that enables her to watch television channels from Ghana and this includes Ghana television. From Ghana town, I came back to Banju, but I realized that Gambia's contribution to the supply of cocoa to Mankasim, which is the hub of cocoa business in Ghana, cannot be underestimated. Though there is no comprehensive studies done to show how much Ajuachere and Kojote we are, have contributed towards the running of the cocoa business in Ghana, it is obvious that these men and women at the Mankasim market largely depend upon them to make a living. Edward Nyaku, reporting from the Gambia. That was my journey to the Gambia, where Ghanaians there are making sure that you get kaku on your table to enjoy your food. Have a good evening. Let's talk business now. The Standard Chartered Bank has pledged to bolster government's effort to make the economy vibrant. The managing director of the bank, Mrs. Mansa Nete, who called on President Ekufuadu at the Flagstaff House, said the bank has set up an SME department to support small businesses to expand. Director of Standard Chartered Bank Ghana, Mrs. Mansa Nete, and her team were at the Flagstaff House to assure the president of the bank's readiness to support government. The bank is listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange with the highest priced stock. Standard Chartered Bank currently has close to 30 branches and more than 50 ATMs across Ghana with a staff strength of more than 1,000. According to management, the bank is committed to building a sustainable business in the long term in Ghana and will continue to uphold high standards in corporate governance, social responsibility, environmental protection and employee diversity. The managing director of the bank, Mrs. Mansanetti, is the first female to steer the affairs 
of the bank in its 120 years of existence. We've carved out a special unit, mainly because of the importance of the SME sector and the development of the economy. So it's an area that we're, we're looking at. And, and also with regards to the, the ratings advisory, that's an area that we, we focus on as well and we advise the, the, the Ministry on, Ministry of Finance on. Um, we, we have actually had some good news today straight from the press, uh, Dr. Bahomi, I don't know whether you've heard about it, about Fitch upgrading the outlook of Ghana from, from negative to stable. Um, so, yeah, these are the areas with which, so we're very glad, to, yeah, congratulations on, on that, and we're very, I'm very glad to be taking over at this point. The president, Nane Kufuado, asked the bank to roll out products that will help boost the country's agricultural sector. Now, it's not going to be possible unless we have a very progressive mindset and attitude on the part of those who hold the money in our country. Uh, buying paper and investing your money in paper, yeah, I'm sure it looks good on the balance sheet, but it doesn't do too much for the development of the country's economy. And all of us should agree that that has to be the real goal, because in 10, 20, 30 years' time, for the bank to find itself to a viable entity is because it is part of an expanding, growing, and flourishing economy. And it is these two areas, principally, that are going to be responsible for that development. He gave the assurance that government will create an enabling environment for business to thrive. You've come with a very exciting time in the history of our country, a challenging time in the history of the banks. Banks all over the world have been going through major problems. And uh, how to reposition oneself and try to master the events of a very unstable and uncertain world economy. It's, it's not been easy. It will not be easy for you in charge, Sandra Charter, but uh, if you've had the capacity to get this far, no doubt that you'll have the capacity to, to master the environment as well. The president said his administration is ready to partner with business. in business, members of the Nigerian business community in Ghana have appealed to government to reconsider the $300,000 mandatory equity required by prospective foreign investors who wish to operate in the country. According to them, the waiver stipulated in the Ghana Investment Promotion Center Act does not augur well for business as Ghana hopes to deepen economic ties with the rest of the world. They made this request when they paid a Ketsi call on the vice president, Dr. Mamadou Baumia, at the Flagstaff House in Accra. The Nigerian business community delegation were at the Flagstaff House to congratulate the present administration for assuming office. They commended government on some policies announced to make the economy more business friendly. The delegation, led by the Nigerian High Commissioner to Ghana, Mrs. Adebunke Sunaike Ayodeji, including chief executives of Nigerian banks operating in the country and some other Nigerian captains of business. Mrs. Sunaike Ayodeji also commended government for its planting for food and jobs initiative and said her country is ready to partner with government for mutual benefit. We wish to reiterate our full commitment to the economic policy of the government of President Akufo Addo. The request for the courtesy visit is to assure Mr. President, through you, sir, that Nigerians doing business in Ghana will work positively with the present administration in achieving all the laudable economic goals set out. The Vice President, Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia, reiterated government's commitment to making the Ghanaian economy business friendly and also facilitate the deepening of the ECOWAS integration process. He said bureaucracies will be streamlined for smooth operations of businesses at the country's port. Everybody wants to be business friendly for good reason. Uh, so we want to also be business friendly. And so we want to make sure the tax environment is very conducive to businesses. Uh, we want to make sure the bureaucracy is, 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 is taking away uh, one of the areas we are looking at which Next week, we are having a really major conference on in Ghana. It's the ports. Anybody doing business in Ghana that has interaction with the ports will know that 
it may not be the most business friendly uh, port uh, that you will meet. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the only one in the continent, but I think that we have to make strides to do exactly that. Nigerian investment in Ghana spans across aviation, oil and gas, banking, finance and telecommunication, among others. Let's talk sports now. The remains of the president of the Ghana Amateur Boxing Federation, Mr. Gideon Korte, has been laid to rest in Accra. The 51-year-old boxing administrator died on Wednesday, March 15, 2017. Hundreds of well-wishers from all over the country converged on the forecourt of the La Trade Fair Center to pay their last respects to the man who had great passion for boxing in the country, the late Gideon Korte Korte. The late Gideon Korte was the pillar in the development of amateur boxing in the country for many years. His dedication to building the game in Ghana will forever be on the minds of boxing lovers. In 2003, Gideon started the Dade Boxing Gymnasium Club at Laboni. Through this medium, he discovered and nurtured many talented boxers from many regions of the country. One of his products is the WBC International Gold Bantamweight Champion, Duke Micah. In May 2015, the late Gideon Korte was elected president of the Ghana Amateur Boxing Federation, now Ghana Boxing Federation. He was the vice chairman of the federation for more than two years under the chairmanship of Ambassador Ray Kwaku. The late Kwarte was also the chairman for the Greater Accra Amateur Boxing Association for more than five years. In the early hours of Wednesday, March 15 this year, Mr. Kwarte passed on after complaining of heart pains. The late Kwarte led a philanthropic life as he was the golden spoon that fed many people most of which were on the blind side of his family. Gideon, the affable and loving family man, left behind a wife and four children. His mortal remains were interred at the La Trade Fair Cemetery. That will be all for sports. Entertainment is next. Ghanaian contemporary high-life artist known as Bisake Day has been appointed as the ambassador for tourism in La Côte d'Ivoire. Bisake Day, without knowing how much he is worth to the Ivorians, has been honored as a tourism ambassador. According to the citizens in La Côte d'Ivoire, Bisake Day's music is the only music they listen to aside their usual francophone style. And having him in their country means so much to them that they wish he never comes back.
Redomel Gold Plus. Spraying technique. Spray your cocoa pods with Redomel Gold Plus to protect your harvest from black pod. To get a good harvest, you should use Redomel Gold Plus every four weeks from the start of the rainy season until September. The best time to spray Redomel Gold Plus is early in the morning before 11 a.m. Later in the day, the change in wind direction may blow the Redomel Gold Plus away from the pods and pollute the person spraying. Spray the Redomel Gold Plus onto the cocoa pods. Spray each pod from the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree. When you have sprayed all the pods on the tree, move on to the next tree until you have sprayed all the trees on your farm. Remember to use 150 gram sachet of Redomel Gold Plus per each tank full of water and 650 gram sachet of Redomel Gold Plus for every acre of your cocoa farm. Keep watching the weather reports and I'll see you same time right here only on GTV. And this is where we part company this Saturday evening. Join us again at 10.30 for the week's compilation piece on this week. Enjoy your Saturday.